Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. O oh Lord, we are grateful to Thee tonight for this another grand privilege that we have to come in Thy presence to offer to Thee our thanksgiving and to sing the hymns of the church and to worship Thee with all of our heart. And we would pray, Lord, that if there be anything against us on thy books tonight. As we confess our wrongs, may the blood of thy Son, Jesus, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we would pray, Father, that you would heal the sick tonight that is here, that sick and needy. May you send your word and make them to believe on thee. Amen and on thy provision for their health. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless the Philadelphian church that's sponsoring this meeting tonight. Bless its pastor, our brother Mead. And we pray that you'll supply all that they have need of for this journey. May it grow in grace and in power and in membership. Bless other churches who are coming in with the fellowship of this meeting tonight. We would ask that you would bless all that's present. Amen. And our beloved brother Joseph, who leaves us now for the foreign fields, let the angels of the Lord go with him and instruct him and make his path clear before him that he will not walk and stumble, but... uh, hand of God will be with him to uphold him. Get glory unto thyself, Lord, and finally at the end of the journey, and when time shall be no more and blend into eternity, may we meet at thy throne as unbroken families, sing in the redemption songs, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me be seated. I am very grateful tonight for the privilege of being here in this meeting, for the farewell meeting for Brother Joseph. As we have explained it this week, that it was almost an accident that, or I would not want to place it that way, I would say that it must have been the divine leading of the Holy Spirit. I was supposed to be in the Fiji Isles this week. And next week or tomorrow, I was to begin in Sydney, Australia. But somehow uh, something happened that I had to postpone that a few weeks before going in. Our loyal and beloved brother Billy Grimm has left now and Maybe it's for the best that they recuperate just a little bit from the great meeting that he had. And then it's time for the full gospel to spread the country. And we pray that God will help that to be true. We are certainly soliciting the prayers of this Chicago people to be praying for me. I know that it will be a real rough job. But we do not want to shirk, no matter how rough it is. Or we know the treatment that Billy got, and we know the treatment that Oral Roberts got, and I expect to go get my share. But uh, if it's my lot, We cannot be carried home to heaven on the flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. You know the old hymn. And we love to take our part. And so now, I pray, Joseph, God be with you. There was just one thing that I didn't just exactly approve of the night 
I just maybe got here at the wrong time. <laughs> I come in and I heard them say that they were taking an offering to give to me. That should be Joseph. You take it, brother. <laughs> I, I got to meet Brother Osborne's associate. And he just so wonderfully gave me an invitation of Brother Robert, or Brother Osborne called him this afternoon or he talked to him on me, come down to visit him at his home. Brother Osborne's picture was showed here this afternoon and I know that you appreciated it. it. You just see where that our efforts are put forth trying to see where they'll meet the best. And the brother Osborne as myself, he would perhaps stay on the foreign fields all the time if he was financially able. The American people has the money and the peoples over there are needing the gospel. So you see, that's why our hearts bleed. We love our American brethren. But, but the thing is that they are dying without knowing Christ. They don't have the opportunities that you have here. When you think of Bombay and Calcutta, or up and down the streets that thousands lay dying, starving to death, and mothers with their little babies, their little bellies swell away up from hunger, that mother laying begging for just a penny or two pennies to try to spare its life then how can you sit down and eat in peace when such is going on? You just should take a trip sometime, then it would be different. It would be different if you ever saw it. Little black boys in Africa who doesn't know which is right or left hand, never had a bath in his life, and standing there with his little hands out, never heard the name of Jesus in his life. He's got just as much right to hear about Jesus as our children has. So it's on my heart to get to them as quick as I can and help them. And I know that's the burden of Brother Osborne and Brother Joseph and whoever visits those fields. You're never the same anymore. And I would like to say if there would happen to be some of the... uh, Officials of this fine school that has given us the opportunity to have this meeting here tonight, I wish to thank them from the very depths of my heart for letting us have this school auditorium tonight. May the Lord bless them richly. And I believe it's written in the Scriptures, in so much as you have did unto the least of these, my little ones, you have done it unto me. May that reward return to this school. And now, I suppose in a few days I'll be up in Cleveland, Tennessee, and then from there down into California, and perhaps for that time ready to go overseas again. So pray for us. God bless you. And this has been a glorious time of fellowship at all the places I have visited. And now tonight, I want to call your attention to just a line of a verse found in Jeremiah 8.22. Reads like this. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Jeremiah, many hundreds of years ago, was commanded of Jehovah to stand in the gates of the city and ask this question. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Or is there no physician there? The question is, why? Then he said, is the daughter of my people not recovered? The word why, God 
ask that question. When God has made a way for people to escape danger or to escape sickness or troubles or disasters, provides a way of escape and the people turn it down and refuse it, then God asks, why? What's the reason that you don't accept it? Like in the scriptures found in the book of Second Kings, the first chapter, Ahab, the unruly king of Samaria, had died and his son had taken his place. And he was an ungodly man just like his father, Ezekiah. And one day when he was walking in his porch, he fell through the lattice. Falling to the ground, he injured himself and some disease set into his body. And then he called two of his soldiers, our temple guards, and sent them up to Ekron to the temple of Beelzebub, the god of that country, which was a devil god, something like a, a fortune teller. And he said, go and inquire by Beelzebub, by the prophets of Beelzebub, am I going to come off of this bed or not? And as they started, the angel of the Lord come to Elijah the Tishbite, the true prophet of God, and told him what was going on and said, Go stand in the way and head these men off. And he did. And he said to them, Is not there a God in Israel? Isn't there a prophet in Israel that you can consult about these matters? Why do you go up to Beelzebub? It wasn't because there wasn't a God in Israel. Neither was it because there wasn't a prophet in Israel. But it was the king's stubbornness and his hatred for the true prophet of Israel. It wasn't because that God hadn't supplied the remedy. It was because that he was too stubborn and he didn't like Elijah, because Elijah had predicted all the evil that happened to his father. Therefore, he had created by the habits of his home to hate a man of God, to despise him and reject him. And if you reject the true and living God, there's only one other thing you can go to. That's an untrue God or a false God. If this people of this nation refuses to serve the true and living God, there's only one thing left for them to accept. That's the false God. If there is a true religion of Jehovah and people refuse to walk in that religious order, then there's only one thing for them to do. That's find some other false way to walk in it. And how foolish it seems to the mind, the reasonable mind, that could reason out. Why take something false when you can have something true? Why would man go after the things of the world to satisfy that thirst that's in him when God created that thirst for him to thirst after God. Why would he satisfy it with drinking and gambling and carousing when there is 
peace and joy and long suffering and goodness and mercy in God. Why would a man falsely fill his self full of poison liquors to make him get out and be carefree only to know that he's damned his soul and, and diseased his body? When there is a spirit of the living God that can give him eternal peace and satisfaction. Why would a man or a woman smoke cigarettes to try to calm their nerves when he is the lily of the valley? Where do you get opium from the lily? That's where opium comes from and he is the lily of the valley. And he has all of the the things that you need to quieten your nerves. You don't have to smoke. That'll kill you. I think it's Reader's Digest that says there'll be 133,000 Americans die this year from smoking cigarettes. And why would you do that to quieten your nerves? When you can come into the house of God and find peace and rest. Seems there's something wrong mentally. Like it was a Ezekiah. It's because that you have created something within you. Oh, I don't like to go to church. I I wouldn't want to be that kind of a person if I had to give up cigarettes and give up my drinking and I, I just wouldn't want that kind of religion. Well, it's just like Ezekiah was. If he didn't want to hear from God, then he had to hear something falsely. There's people today, it's just like this, a man dying on the doorsteps of a doctor's office. When the doctor in the building has the cure for his disease, but he refuses to take it. If the man has a disease and the doctor has the cure for it, and the man may lay on the doctor's doorstep, but if he refuses to take his medicine, he'll die on the doorstep. You can't blame the doctor. The doctor would give him the medicine that would cure him. If he'd only come take it. But it isn't the doctor's fault. He's got the remedy, but the man's too stubborn to take it. Then whose fault is it? So is it today that many people die in front of the church on the steps in the pews Die in their sins because they refuse to accept God's bomb that's in Gilead. They die in their sins because they refuse it. Not because there isn't any there, but they just refuse to take it. Then what will they take? They have to take something false instead. It's not because there's none there, because there is. But men and women just refuse to take it. And they die. Die in the church. Sit in the meetings and listen night after night to inspired prophets of God who takes the word fearlessly and lays it out. He must be born again. Men and women sit in the pews and die and sink into utter despair and annihilated from God. Not because there's not grace and salvation, but because they refuse to receive it. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Then why is the daughter of my people so sick? Isn't there a physician there to minister this? Sure there is. God has his prophets yet. God has his bomb yet. And God's daughter is sick and she hasn't recovered. 
But it isn't because that there's no bomb. There isn't because that there's no prophet. But it's because the daughter refused to take the medicine. <laughs> That's true. Medicines. If you refuse the medicine, then there's nothing to be done. Now, medicine has to be tested. They take medicine and they, first when they find a toxin that they think it's for some ailment, they try it on guinea pigs. And they take the toxin after the science has worked on it for a long time and they shoot it into a, a little guinea pig. And they watch his reaction. If it doesn't hurt the little guinea pig, then they use it on human beings. But medicine is a chance to take. For some medicines that will help one human being might kill another. So you have to watch that. Because it, it's... it's Sometimes you must be sure that you know what you're doing and let a doctor that knows how to give it, give it to you. Someone that you got confidence in. And now we are here so much today about heart disease. They say that heart trouble is the number one killer in America. Heart trouble isn't the number one killer. It's sin that's the number one killer in America. Sin is what does the killing. Medicine, you might be able to patch up your body a little while. And that body is going to die anyhow. It's going back to the dust of the earth. But that soul will live somewhere forever. That's the killer, is sin to the soul. That's number one killer in America. So many people say, I just got to do this. I just got to do that. Someone said to me not long ago, said, Billy, I... I would love to be a Christian, but I had a habit that I inherited from my father. And he said, that habit is playing cards, gambling. He said, it's worse than any other habit. And he said, I just have to play cards. I spoke to a, a woman some time ago and she was looking so frail. She had noticed sometime in her younger days of this advertisement on the televisions and the signboards of, of beautiful women smoking cigarettes. And the company says that it will make you thin. That's when they sold their product to the public. If it makes you thin, it's because you're dying. It's TB and cancer that's making you thin. She said, I just have to smoke. I'm a slave to it. Well, you don't have to be a slave to it. There is a bomb in Gilead. There's a bomb in Christ. There's a cure for it. You don't have to do it. You don't have to drink. You don't have to smoke. You don't have to gamble. The reason you do it is because you refuse the remedy. You'll die on the church steps until you take the remedy. That cures. That's what satisfies. That's what takes sin away. They say, I just can't help it. You can't help it. What if the man laying on the doctor's steps said, Oh, I know he's got the medicine in there to cure this disease, but I just can't go in. Why can't you go in? And in this case, you're even persuaded and trying to pull you in for the sin of your soul. But yet people won't do it. 
What is sin? It's your unbelief. If you believe God, you'd rush to Calvary just as quick as you could. God has a remedy for unbelief. No wonder people don't believe in divine healing these days. Don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's because that they've never been inoculated from unbelief yet. Now, there was a time when there was no toxin for diphtheria. Many died because there was no toxin. And there was a time when there was no toxin for typhoid fever. But they got toxins today for those things. And there was a time when there was no bomb in Gilead for your sins. But there is a bomb in Gilead today. For in today in the house of David, the city of David in the house of God is a fountain open for washed and clean the unclean. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins where unbelievers plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. Men and women who's made in the image of God stand and say that God's word's not right. They doubt this and they doubt whether it's so or not. There's a fountain to take care of that. As I was speaking on the private interviews today and met a couple, a man and his son, I said, you can never, never go forward until you're perfectly satisfied and know without a shadow of doubt you're walking in God's will. Then when you know that you're in God's will and walking in His way, nothing can stop you. Because you know where you're standing. You know the way you're going. You know what you got in your mind. You know what the will of God is. Then you can do it. Now, when God got ready to make an appropriation for sin in the Old Testament, it wasn't too sure. Because that he took it under the sacrificial suffering of animals, like the guinea pigs and so forth. And there was no spirit in those animals who could return back to the worshiper when the blood cell was broken and the life of the animal was taken. But God has a sure cure now. And you don't have to guess. It'll help everybody because whosoever will may come and take from the waters of life freely. It won't help one and kill another. For it will help all whosoever will may come. All unbelievers are invited that they might wash themselves and be inoculated from their unbelief. It's a sure cure, a double cure. God has for you. Now, it was questioned, but one day down on the river of Jordan, when an old preacher standing down there with a piece of camel skin wrapped around him, eat wild locusts and honey for his meat, God didn't send a guinea pig, but he sent his own son. For the test of this inoculation or bomb. And as soon as he was baptized, the heavens opened. And God, in the form of a dove descending from heaven, spoke and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. Come upon him. What did it do? It inoculated him from everything called sin. He was tempted in all manners like we are, yet without sin. And then in his death he died like a man, like a human being. But the inoculation proved good on Easter morning. It raised him up from the dead and broke the bands of death and the seals of the grave. And he rose again to prove that this inoculation of eternal life 
has been proven by God's own Son that it will raise up the dead. When it was in his body, and he walked around with it in there, he healed the sick. He did it by visions that God gave him. He said in St. John, the fifth chapter and the 19th verse, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing until he sees his Father do it first. And he did by vision what the Father told him to do. Then after he had proved the serum of God would cure from sin and keep in the hour of temptation. It would not only do that, but it would work miracles through the power of God to this bomb that was in Gilead. Not only that, but after you're dead and laid in the grave, it'll raise you up again. The serum held out. It's the bomb of Gilead. The bomb of heaven that God gave to His Son to inoculate Him to bring the proof. Not a guinea pig for medicine, but a Son from heaven. Proving what He was. And He took it and was anointed with the Spirit and God was in Him performing miracles and signs. They killed His human life on Calvary and He died died and went into the grave and laid there three days and nights but on the third day he broke the bands and rose again for he said this inoculation this bomb will rise me up again at the last days it will raise me up after three days now he prescribed it to his disciples and he said don't go to some seminary to learn to preach but wait in the city of Jerusalem till you've been inoculated with the toxin from heaven. That'll take care of you. That'll hold you in the hours of temptation. And with this toxin, when you're anointed with it, it's eternal life. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Inoculate everyone who will believe. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Brother, sister, because the world's grouping in darkness and sin, it's not because there's not a bomb in Gilead. It's because people refuse to take it. Not because there isn't a power that will take man from the saloon, from the pool tables. It's not a, because there's no grace in God that will shed in your heart, that will make you live right and act right and be right. It's because they refuse to take it. That's why the daughter, God's daughter, the church is so sick. It's not because there's not a physician, a doctor of this disease. A preacher who will tell the truth and preach it. we got them. Plenty of those. It's because the daughter won't take it. There's plenty of medicine. But the people die right in the church. Sinful. They die on the doorsteps. They die passing the churches. Because they refuse to take the inoculation. Now, after that... They had, these 120 gathered in an upper room and all of a sudden there came down that same spirit like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And 120 was inoculated from death and from sin by the toxin of the Holy Ghost that come up on them. They went forth everywhere preaching. Signs. What kind of signs? The same signs that was with him, the the chief doctor. The same signs that followed Jesus, their Lord. The same signs of eternal life. A man laying in the shadow of death. They spoke the word of the Lord Jesus and he leaped to his feet. He got life. Why? Why? Because they had something to give him. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. 
the very same signs that followed Jesus when he came to be as it was the guinea pig to prove the serum was right, the bomb was right. The one who came to prove it held back nothing, but he preached to those Pharisees and called them hypocrites and snakes in the grass. He didn't go out for popularity. He came to his own and his own received him not. That's the way it is every time. And if they've called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call them of his disciples? He told them what this inoculation would do to them. It would make them odd and peculiar. Not understood by the world, but they were precious in the sight of God who sent the serum to save his own people. Then we find out that they had signs and wonders, the same signs that Jesus had. For he said, the works that I do shall you also. Greater than this shall you do, for I'll go to my Father. The same signs of eternal life. If the eternal life brought them signs in that day to those who had it, the same eternal life will do the same thing today. If there's still a bomb in Gilead. Or is there? Has those days passed? Are they gone? Did God run out of inoculation for His church? Did He do it? If He did, woe unto the church. But on the day of Pentecost, while they were shouting and praising God, the question come up, Man and brethren, what can we do to become inoculated? And Dr. Simon Peter wrote out a prescription. (laughs) And he said, this prescription is going to be good for you and for your children. And for every generation, as many as the Lord our God shall call, can use this prescription. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall be inoculated. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is God's inoculation. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. There is a bomb. In Jesus tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, there is a bomb. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, that I'll do. There's a bomb in Gilead. In my name, they shall cast out evil spirits. They'll lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. There is a bomb in Gilead. If you cannot be rid of your drinking, of your gambling, and that evil spirit that's making you, you women, dress immorally out here on the streets. If that evil spirit has caught you, you may be pure fastly, but you'll answer for adultery at the day of the judgment. For Jesus said, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart already. And you'll answer if you present yourself like that. You'll answer before God for committing adultery with every man you presented yourself to. You are the guilty one. You man that can't throw down those, that tobacco habit, that drinking habit, that gambling habit. You don't want to because there's a bomb in Gilead. Sitting here, what, listening to me preach tonight, is one of the worst alcoholics that Chicago ever had. A little lady sitting here, drunken, batty-eyed wretch. But she found the bomb in Gilead one night. And now she's a mission worker for the alcoholics. There is a bomb in Gilead. It's for you. There is a physician in Gilead. But the reason the people is sick is because they won't receive the remedy. Think it over. It's not because now at the judgment that God's going to say, 
Well, I had no bomb. He's got it. And the prescription calls for whosoever will. It's to you and to your children, to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. There's plenty of bomb if you're willing to receive it. Think of it while we bow our heads for prayer. Merciful God, who brought again our Lord Jesus from the dead, raising Him up for our justification, that we might look at an empty tomb tonight and have perfect confidence in Thy Word to come for this great cure for sin, for unbelief, for it is promised by our Lord that whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe, you receive it, and you shall have it. But people need thy bomb. The bomb of Gilead poured into their soul, the rich, royal, holy oil of God called the Holy Spirit. May it saturate every soul here tonight to believe thee. May they take the prescription that the Apostle Peter wrote out at the day of Pentecost. Bring repentance to their heart, faith to their soul, that they might receive joy unspeakable and full of glory. Grant it, Lord. Through Jesus Christ's name we pray. With our heads bowed, I would like to ask this solemn question. How many people present would like to come to that fountain? Would want God to put His Spirit so richly in you like it was in Jesus? So much that you could resist temptation. That you've tasted something so much better than tobacco. Something so much better pleasures and drinking will give. So much better pleasures of going to church than it would be to go to a card party. You'd like to have that. You'd love to have it so you could live free from sin. Not because you're not tempted, but in every temptation, He'll make a way of escape. Would you like to take that inoculation? There's a bomb in Jesus tonight. Would you love for Him to pour in upon your soul? like he did those at Pentecost, if you would like to be remembered, raise your hand. And by this you say, Lord, I want your Spirit on me. God bless you. He sees every hand. He knows every intention. He knows every heart. Lord, you've seen those hands. And as the prophet Jeremiah was commanded of you, O Lord, to stand in the temple gate, And call out, is there no bomb in Gilead? The church was so sin sick. He said, is not there a physician who can minister this bomb? Then if the bomb be there and the minister be there, then why is the church so sick? God grant tonight That each one who is is sick of the world and sick of their life and their sins and their unbelief and flusterations and doubts, you know their hearts. May, O Lord God, you apply that bomb tonight, the Holy Spirit that sweetens and takes away sin and, and gives a desire to walk free from sin. And in the hour of temptation sustains us with His presence. May it be so, Lord, that each person that's in divine presence may become that person tonight. Like the apostles received it at Pentecost and the prescription was given. May each follow that line of thought, that prescription that the apostle gave us, which is recognized all down through the Bible. And even after Paul, one born out of season, come to the end of the road and they were going to cut his head from his shoulders. And death was staring him in the face and the grave said so much, I'll mold you, Paul. 
But he looked it in the face and said, Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God, to Jesus Christ, who gives us the victory. The bomb, the inoculation, that we know that death cannot hold us. Though we be a spoonful of ashes, God shall speak and we'll rise. We pray that you'll bless, Lord, in a masterless way tonight. Just let your loving arms get to each heart and take your position in their soul and lead them from this night on. I believe they raise their hands sincerely. And I know you have said, He that will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. And I pray, God, that when they raise their hands and made that surrender, that you wrote their names in the Lamb's book of life and you fill them with the Holy Spirit. We ask this for Jesus' sake and in His name. Amen. 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 Just a little hymn now before we start to praying for the sick. Oh, how I love Jesus. I'm sure we all know that. While we just sing this hymn and worship. All right, if they'll give us a card. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He Believers in here, raise your hand on this second verse. I'll never forsake him. Raise your hand. Give him that pledge. I'll never forsake him. I'll never forsake him. I'll never forsake. Lord bless you richly. Just before the prayer for the sick, I would like to make just a little statement. And I wish this above all things that you hear tonight, that who believes in your heart that you love the Lord and something has happened to you, promise me that you'll find a good gospel church somewhere. A church that teaches the full gospel, the power of God, His resurrection. Join up with those people and make yourself a church home. Don't just stray around loose on the streets. Go get a good church somewhere of your choice. Where the gospel and the power of God is made known. And the signs of eternal life is in there. The signs that was in Christ. Christ said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And the first vine that come out of the branch brought forth a Pentecostal vine that went forth preaching the gospel. Signs and wonders that followed the Lord Jesus followed that church. If that vine produced that kind of a branch, the first one, the next vine will have to produce, the next branch will have to be like the, ne- the first vine. And every vine that comes out of that branch will be like the first one. There can be no difference because it's the same life that's supporting the first branch supports to the last branch. And the same fruit that come on the first branch on the vine will be on the last branch of the vine. Now when Jesus is here on earth, He did not claim to be a healer. All knows that. He said, It's not me that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. What I referred to in my sermon, the bomb, the Holy Spirit that came like a dove and set upon him and went into him and he was filled with God. 
He was God. God was in him without measure. He's in us by measure. We're adopted children. But we're children just the same. A spoonful of water out of this big lake out here have the same chemicals that the whole lake's got. But it's just not as much of it. Now, we find him going about. Let's watch his ministry just for a moment. And we're contending that Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We see the first branch bear that fruit. Let's see what he was, and then we can tell what the first branch was and what this branch ought to be. We find Jesus in St. John 1. As soon as he had been filled with the Holy Spirit and came from the wilderness, we find that a man named Andrew got converted and went and found his brother Simon. And Simon came up into the presence of the Lord Jesus, and Jesus told him who he was, what his name was, and what his father's name was. St. John, the first chapter. That astonished the fishermen. And he told him, said, Your name is Simon, and you're the son of Jonas, but from henceforth you shall be called Peter, which means little rock or little stone. Immediately after that, there was one standing there by the name of Philip. And he was so thrilled by seeing this, he took off 15 miles around the mountain and found his brother Nathaniel, a friend of his, under a tree praying and said, Come see who we found, the Messiah. On his road back, he began to talk to him what he'd said about Peter, <clears throat> about calling his father's name. And then when he came into the presence of the Lord Jesus, Jesus looked at him and said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. St. John, the first chapter, the beginning of his ministry. And when he looked at him, he said, Rabbi, how did you know me? I've never seen you before and you've never seen me. How did you know that I was an Israelite, a just man with no guile? How did you know that? He said, before Philip called you, I saw you when you were under the tree. That was Jesus yesterday. And what did this believer say? Now, no man can believe without God calls him to believe. You might have said, the, the meetings produce three classes of people. And one of them is an unbeliever, the next is a make-believer, and the next is a believer. That's the three classes of people that the gospel brings. It's always from Moses' time and all the way through. Always been from Eden. Cain, a make-believer. Abel, a believer. And it's been that way all along. And he said, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you when you were under the tree, I saw you. He had been right there all the time. But he saw him before he come to the meeting and told him what he was doing. He said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. But there was those standing by who down in their heart, they said, this man is that evil one, that fortune teller, Beelzebub. And Jesus perceived their thoughts, what they were thinking about. And he turned to them. Now, the Bible said they didn't say it out loud, but they said it in their heart. And Jesus, knowing their hearts, he turned to them and said, You say that about me, I'll forgive you. But the day will come when the Holy Ghost comes. To do the same thing, one word against it will never be forgiven in this world or the world to come. In the fourth chapter of St. John, he had need to go by Samaria. There was a woman of Samaria come out to get water. We believe her to be a woman of ill fame. Jesus sent his disciples into the town because he had had a vision on what was going to happen. Because later he said so. And the woman started to let down a bucket to get the water. And he said, woman, bring me a drink. And she astonished, turned to look to see this Jew. And she said... It's not customary for you Jews to ask us women of Samaria to such things as that of Samaria. He said, because we have no uh, dealings with each other, a segregation. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And I'd give you water you don't come here to draw. She said, the well's deep and you've got nothing to draw with. What was he doing? Carrying her conversation. Finally, the father revealed what was in her heart. 
How many knows what was in her heart, what she had done? So Jesus said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. She said, he said to her, thou hast said well, I have no husband. Because you've had five husbands, and the one that you're now living with is not your husband. Wherefore, you've said right. Now, what did she say? You are Beelzebub? No. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, we know, we Samaritans, we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But who are you? He said, I'm he. And she ran into the city, listened to her message. Come see a man who's told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? And they went out and believed. Is that right? Amen. Now that was Jews and Gentiles. Ham and Shem's people. Japheth's people is next. That's us. The Gentiles wasn't looking for the coming of Christ then. The Jews and Samaritans was. Now the Jews and Samaritans are off to one side because they rejected him in whole. God took a remnant out of them. And now it's the Gentiles for 2,000 years has waited for the coming of the Lord. God is a just God. And promise that these same things would take place just before the coming of the Messiah because it's a pressing of His Spirit coming. Getting His church ready. The bomb is to return to Gilead. Now, Jesus said in St. John 5, the next chapter, when He passed through the gate and there was a man crippled there and, and lots of crippled, impotent people, thousands of them. He went under the pool of Bethesda. And he looked all around. The father showed him a vision where a man was laying on a little pallet that had some kind of a retarded disease that had it 38 years and he passed blind, crippled, halt, lame. Went by them until he found this man laying on a pallet. And he said, Will thou be made whole? He said, I have no one to put me in the water. He said, Take up thy bed and go into the house. And the man never questioned. He picked up the bed and went into the house. Immediately, what taken place? The Jews found fault with that. And so they questioned Jesus. In other words, why didn't you heal all the rest of them? You're such a great healer. Make all the rest of them well. This St. John 5, 19, listen to what he said. Verily, verily, that's absolutely, absolutely, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing within himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Jesus said before he died for our sins to be the atonement so that the bomb of Gilead could come back to us to carry the work on. He said, these things that I have done, you shall do also. More than this shall you do, for I go unto my Father. A little while and the unbelieving world will see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, the church, the believer, for I, personal pronoun, will be with you even in you to the end of the age. That is Jesus, the Son of God, who still by His death at Calvary, who shed His blood, sanctifies His church and puts it in order and puts the Spirit back in His church like He did on Pentecost. And the Pentecostal church went forth, the first church, and performed the same kind of signs that Jesus did because God was with them, working with them, confirming the Word with signs following now, Lord, it is your service, it is your church, it's your people, it's your gifts. These are sick and needy. Let thy spirit, Lord, thy bomb, to each and every sick person that's laying on the great physician's step tonight, may they see and understand this is not dead, the great physician, but as raised from the dead and is living in his church. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now let him speak from here. And declare whether he is alive or not. That's Now, we know the Scripture claims it. But will he keep his word? If he's God, he's got to keep his word. If the Scriptures isn't right, then we could worship and take the Koran from the Mohammed or the, the Jains or the Sikhs or whatever religion we desire. But all the religions in the world is false but Christianity. I stood with the Bible in one hand and the Koran in the other and challenged the Mohammedan priest to come forth. Yes, sir. God is God. He's the God of Elijah. 
He's the same God today that He ever was. If He ever was God, He's still God. So, let's not rush now to get into the prayer line. Let's come reverently in order. Let the prayer cards begin with number one. Is that, it starts from number one. One day in her great uh, troubles, Jesus came along. Don't you believe He's just as interested in you as He was that woman? Now, if you have no prayer card, then perhaps right now and you're sick, your troubles is doubled, it seems like. But Jesus always comes to those who are in double trouble. Don't you believe that? And she was uh, very seriously sick. So one morning, say she was sitting on the front porch, uh, a knitting. And she seen a little boat tossed out into the river or the Sea of Galilee. And as she looked, 12 men, 13 men to be exact, landed in the willows down by the lakeside. And while the boat was coming along and the people began to get out, there was something begin to tug at her heart that she should go down to the seaside. And when she got there, she found there was that prophet of Galilee. Oh, he was called a heretic. He was called out of his mind. How many knows that Jesus was declared insane? He certainly was. How many knows that every one of the apostles was declared insane? Absolutely. Jesus Christ was declared insane. We know that thou art mad and have a devil. What is mad? Crazy insanity. Paul. Paul, thou art mad. Too much learning has made thee mad. But he said, in the way that's called heresy... That's the way I worship the God of our fathers. I like to stand by Paul's side. Be a fellow citizen of the kingdom of God and suffer with him here and also reign with him there. In the way that's called heresy, crazy. And this little woman come down, and of course, perhaps, maybe, the, her church members were there and they would have made fun of her. But she thought that Jesus was correctly the Son of God. So she said, He's a holy man. He's from God. He's, if I can only touch the border of His garment, I believe I'll be healed. Is that true? So she pushed through the press until she touched the border of His garment and everybody was shaking hands with Him. Good morning, Rabbi, a reverend, whatever, teacher, pastor, and hugging Him. But Jesus stopped all of a sudden. The little woman was scared, so she ran away and say she went out in the audience and sat down like you are now. Jesus turned around and said, Who touched me? And Peter said, Well, Lord, all's touching you. How can you say such a thing? Who has touched me? Everybody's touching you. He said, But I perceive that I have gotten weak. Virtue has gone from me. In other words... All them touches was all right, but they wasn't the right kind to touch. I perceive that I've gotten weak. If it would make him weak, what would it do to us as sinners saved by grace? We would never stand it if he didn't say, More than this shall you do. Greater is the King James translation, but the Greek is more. You couldn't do greater. He'd done as far as stop nature and raise the dead, there could be nothing greater done. But more of it because he'd be that uh, the bomb, the Holy Spirit that was in him, BLM, was spread out all over the earth in his church. More than this shall you do, for I go unto my Father. He divided himself with every believer. Don't you believe that? Every believer, his spirit, he divided with every believer. And more than this shall you do, for I go unto my Father. Now, the woman touched his garment and he looked around. Everybody, not me, not me. And finally there was a great power in him, the anointing of the Holy Ghost that could perceive the thoughts of the people's mind. So he looked out over the audience and that little woman is thinking, Oh, I've done something wrong. Maybe I, I have done wrong. But, oh Lord, you know I needed it. 
And Jesus looked at her and told her that her blood issue was healed because she had believed. He picked her right out of the audience and told her her condition. Now you out there without a prayer card would say, Oh, I wish I could have been standing there. I would do the same thing. But alas, he's dead and gone. Oh no, he rose again. He's not dead, but he is alive forevermore. And the scriptures, to any of you Bible students or, or teachers of, of theology, the scripture says in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, that right now, Jesus Christ is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How would he act if you touched him? If he's the same Jesus, he'd act the same way he did because he can act no other way. So you look to him tonight, you without a prayer card. How many in here does not have a prayer card and you want Jesus to heal you? Raise up your hand. Anywhere. Now you just look to him. Remember, I'm your brother. There's not one thing about me could heal. I'm just a man. I have no powers to heal. No other man has any power to heal. There's no such a thing as a divine healer. But there's no such a thing as any kind of healing besides divine healing. God is the only one who can create and who cannot heal without creating. When you break your arm, the doctor don't claim to heal your arm. He sets your arm. God heals it. See? God, the doctor can remove a growth, but the God has to create the cells to heal it back. Medicine does not heal. It only assists nature. God is the creator who creates. So there's no other healing but divine healing. When people say that there is no divine healing, they've just got the thing turned right around. There's no other healing but divine healing. God said, I'm the Lord thy God who heals all of thy diseases. His words cannot fail. Now, I'm going to ask for your undivided attention. Ask for no one to move around. Be real reverent. Sit quiet. Be reverent. And watch, believe, pray. I have faith. Just believe. Now just imagine in your mind now of the Lord Jesus coming into the presence of this audience in a visible body. I just try to visualize that. Now I'm going to pray for the sick, but that just that you might see it is people raised their hands a while ago. They had never been in the meeting. Now, I'm going to ask you this question before we start. Now, if there's any in this prayer line that's been used to coming in the prayer lines and knows that each person I stop with them to find out if the holy God of heaven would reveal to me sin in their life, I would... May, Many of us have been in the meeting and see where their sins calls right out and tells them. How many have seen that? Let's, sure. Well, then, see, you have to watch those things. But now remember, if God has permitted sickness to come on you to bring you to discipline, and you refuse to discipline yourself before God, then step out of the line. Don't come in there because you, it might make you worse. If you are sinful and you've got unconfessed sin, make it right with God before you come to God for prayer. Now, I do not heal people. I only pray for people. But if anyone here that's sick, I can tell you by the Word of God that you've been healed since Jesus was wounded for your transgressions and by His stripes you were healed. You've been saved. Every sinner has been saved since He died for you. He settled it. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, Jesus said, it's finished. It's finished. Thou, all the thing you have to do is to accept it. Now, here is a woman. Say, but let this first one here. 
It gives a beautiful picture of what I've spoke of. The St. John, uh, the fourth chapter. A man, Jesus, a Jew, a woman, Samaria, of Samaria. They met for their first time. Now, this is a perfect picture again. A white man, a colored woman, meeting together. Same thing, two races of people. But Jesus let her know that God was God over all races. Our colors, where we was raised at and way we were turned, that has nothing to do with it at all. God made of one blood all man. Yellow, brown, black, white, whatever it may be, we are one blood from Adam. And our racial affairs has nothing to do with God. He's a God of all creation. I suppose we are strangers to one another. This is our first time meeting. God knows us both. But here is a beautiful picture of the well again. Now, if the lady doesn't know me, I do not know her. We have met for our first time. Now, if the Lord God will do something here on the platform like He did in the Bible, the way I've been talking to you about, how many would believe that He was present and would accept it? All right. Now, remember, this is not me, the Holy Spirit. Now, if it happens, you're going to take your opinion. There's only two things you can say it will take it. It'll do it. It has to be supernatural. Because I don't know the lady. She doesn't know me. And we've met for the first time. Just so you see that God still got the bomb in Gilead. If Jesus is raised from the dead and works through his church, then let him work through his church now. See, it's God's word. It's not my word at stake. It's his word at stake. He was the one who made the promise, not me. And then there's two things you can say. You can take the critic's condition and say it was an evil spirit that did it. If you do, you'll never be forgiven in this world or the world to come, said Jesus. If you believe it's God, then you can have what you ask for. Now, I don't even know that you're sick. But imagine you are. And if I come and said, well, she's in the prayer line because she's sick, and I'd say, lady, I'm going to lay my hands on you. You go and you'll get well. That's true. See, because God give that permission. They'll lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. But you'd still question about my sermon. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. You could still question, is that word right? Could it be right? But now, if he comes and anoints me and performs the same thing here, lets me know something that's in your heart, what you're here for, or something about that you know what I know nothing about, then you know that would have to be the Messiah. Would you believe it was? Would you be like the woman that Samaria would go tell your people, come see a man that told me, that not me now, Brother Branham, your brother, but that the Lord Jesus is raised from the dead and working through his church? Would you believe that? The audience has said they would. May the Lord grant it. My prayer. Now, I'm talking to you just like Jesus talked to the woman. He said, bring me a drink. I said, come here. See, we're just talking as Jesus and the woman talk. And I perceive that you are a Christian. You're a believer. That's right. Because as your spirit begins to move, I, now you could have been a critic or unbeliever. See? But your spirit began to feel welcome. Did you ever see that picture of the angel of the Lord? They have in, oh, hundreds have seen it, haven't you, folks? Now, you that seen that picture, that light standing between me and the woman. Now, you're looking at that. You've seen it. You see it. All right. The lady suffers with the stomach trouble. If that's right, raise your hand. Now, do you believe? Now, you might say, Brother Branham, you guessed that from that woman. Well, we'll see if it was a guess. Let the Holy Spirit, because she's a Christian, let it be said that, that it wasn't a guess. <laughs> she's got something on her heart. Someone she's praying for. That's your mother. Hey! Holy, oh. holy, holy Jesus. Yes, Lord. That's your mother. She's not here. She's not even in this country. 
She's from Ohio. Amen. That's right. And she's suffering with a gallbladder trouble. That's right. You're not from here. You're from Waukegan, Illinois. Your name is Mrs. Payne. Go home. You have received what you asked for. Your faith has made you whole. Thou canst believe. What do you think about it, sir? You want to go eat your supper? Get over that stomach trouble? Or just go eat your supper. You believe the arthritis will leave you and you'll be well? Just start walking and saying, thank you, Lord Jesus. Come, sister. You believe the back troubles left you when you come up the steps? Just go praising the Lord. You believe that the nervousness that's been bothering you so long will leave you now? Just start on your road rejoicing. Just have faith and believe God. Don't you believe? Amen. Watch just a moment. Something happened in the audience. It's the man going walking there. Turn this way again, sir. There's something never struck you right. Someone you're praying for. That's right. You were a little disappointed when you left the audience, when you left here. Your wife is in a terrible condition. That's right. Mm-hmm. She's not here. She's got a nervous condition, hasn't she? Go back to Benton Harbor. Believe that God will make her well. That you might know that man sitting back there turned and said to his friend just beyond him there, he's from Benton Harbor also. And he's praying for his pastor who has almost got a nervous breakdown. That's thus saith the Lord. I challenge your faith to believe God. Just have faith now. Be reverent and believe with all your heart. Believe, sister, that the heart trouble will leave you and you won't suffer with it no more. You believe? Then just go rejoicing in Christ. Come, little fellow. You believe this will leave his face? Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for him that you'll heal him. Amen. Don't doubt. Come, sister. Believe him now with all your heart. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for my sister. Amen. Now, the Bible said these signs shall follow. The visions make me so weak, I stagger. And it's just, see, I just have to stop for a minute. All right. You know that I know what's wrong with you, but there's no need to tell you. You believe, you believe, I, you believe I know what's wrong with you? Well, then go eat your supper. Your stomach troubles left you. And you go. See, I, just have faith. Just believe with all your heart. Now, don't look for the visions now because they make me too, uh, too weak. I'd have to leave before the prayer line got out. You believe, don't you? You believe that God could reveal to me what your trouble is? Just so that the people won't think it, it's just one person or something. People out in the audience without prayer cards, just believe. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Believe. Let somebody in the audience believe. Pray for something you have need of. I'm watching for a light. The Holy Spirit to call me. Here, there's a lady sitting right back here with her head bowed. She's the second one. I see somebody keep appearing before. It's a man. She's praying for her brother that's got a nervous condition. That's right. Raise up, lady, if that's right. Stand up to your feet. That is true. All right, you can have what you ask for now. I do not know you. Is that right? I do not know you and you don't know me, but that's exactly what she's praying about. Is that right? If it is, raise your hand so the audience will see it. All right? Go home and find it the way you believe. Amen. Someone else pray and believe. I do not know you. We're strangers to each other. If God will reveal to me what you're here for, what's on your heart, will you believe me to be his prophet or his servant? That it wouldn't be me... You're, my mother's about your age, and I would be anything but a deceiver to some dear mother. You're not here for yourself. You're here for somebody else. And that's your nephew. He's in Ohio. He was hurt in the war. Real nervous. Hurt on the head. And you're standing here in his behalf. 
May the God of heaven reward you and you find him to be well. In Christ's name. Amen. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Come believing now. Don't doubt. Believe. Just be reverent and believe. Come, sir. Lord, I pray that in Christ's name that you will heal our brother. Amen. All right. Come, sister. Do you, when you're passing by here, don't pass by like my brother Brandon. I'm just a brother. See? But as you come by here, know you're fulfilling what Christ asked you to do. Receive your blessing because he promised it to you. See, I can't give it to you. I can tell you by his gift what you're here for. But I can't heal you. You know that, don't you? But if you believe it, you receive it. Your arthritis will leave you. Thanks, Do you believe it? Yeah. All yeah, right, now you go and believe it, it with you, all Jesus. your heart. All right. You must believe, sister, if you live. Cancer would kill you. But, but you believe it. God will heal you of it. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, grant the healing of this woman. Amen. 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 Do you believe, sister? Amen. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, grant the healing of our sister. Amen. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, grant the healing of this man. Come, sister. Do you believe, sister? You believe you're going to get over the arthritis now? You're going to be well? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> you have other things, too, but that's Praise amazing. God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, grant the woman's healing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right, sister, we see you walking on the cane. and We know that only God can heal you. I can't. But if I pray for you, you believe God's going to let you get well? Come here. Then. Lord, I lay my hands up on this woman. One day, pulling down to us the streets of Jerusalem, drug an old rugged cross, dragging out the bloody footprints of the barrier. He fell under the load. His little frail body fell. And Simon come and helped him pack the cross. Here's one of his children. Limping along here on a cane, I lay my hands upon her in the name of Jesus Christ. May she be well. Amen. God bless you, sister, and heal you and make you well. Come, brother. God grant the healing of this young man as I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, may he get well. Amen. Amen. Come, sister. I know you. I believe. Aren't you Sister D'Amico's friend? All right, sister. Oh, Lord, this little servant of yours who has looked to you for healing, how we thank you for in that little group you took that hideous cancer away. And I pray for her, Lord God, that you will heal her and make her well. In the name of the Lord Jesus, while your spirit is present, may our sister reach up now and receive that gift of God. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Bless you, sister dear. All right, come. My little lady, that's a shame. It's a nervous heart that makes you that way. But you want to serve Christ. Is that what you want to be well for, to serve Him? Come here, let me pray. i got a little daughter, Rebecca, about your side. Dear God, I left little Rebecca at home to come pray for this girl. Lord, be merciful to her and grant that she'll be healed as we follow your instructions by laying hands on the sick. You promised these signs should follow them that believe that they would be healed. Let it be, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you, sister. Make you well. Have faith in God. Just be real reverent. Don't doubt. O Christ of God, Heal my sister as I lay hands upon her and ask in the name of Jesus for her healing. Amen. Believe now, sister. Amen. Sister Sims, I know you. Lord God, this dear woman who's cooked meals for me and has been kind to me, thy said in thy word, you will be merciful to those who show mercy. In so much as you have done unto the least, that would be me. Oh, my little ones, you have did it to me. If you shall give one of my disciples only a glass of water in the name of a disciple, you'll not lose your reward. 
grant the desire of her heart through Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Sims, God bless you. Father God, I pray for Brother Sims. Pray that you'll give him the desire of his heart. And grant those blessings, Lord, as he's been kind and showed mercy. You are merciful to those that show mercy shall obtain mercy. And grant, Father, that the desire of his heart be given in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you, brother. Just have faith. Don't doubt. Believe. Do you believe? Out in the audience. The lady right behind the lady with her hand up is suffering with trouble with her eyes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ will make you well? Sitting right on the outside row here. You believe you will? Yes. All right. Right there with the foot trouble, sitting right there. Do you believe that God will make you well? All right. You can have it. Believe with all your heart. Now, if you believe, the lady with her, got her hands up there, see? That's it. That's one. Now, lay your hand over on this other lady, the second lady here, the woman with the foot trouble. You all lay your hands on one another now. Put your hands over on each other, and we'll pray. All right, lay your hands. That's right. Lord God. They are believers or they have never been able to touch Jesus. I pray, Father, that you will give to them the desire of their heart. They have touched the high priest. Let's call them out. May they be healed through Jesus' name. Amen. Don't doubt now. Go home. Be well. For the kingdom of God's sake. Amen. Are you the lady to be prayed for? Do you believe me to be his servant? Are we strangers to each other? We are. And do you believe that God can reveal to me the secret of your heart? I sure do. You're a real believer. Amen. You are here for a female trouble. That's right. That female trouble was caused by a childbirth. That's right. Uh-huh. You're Mrs. McCullough. That's right. You return home, you can be well. Jesus Christ makes you well. Come, sister, believe me. Oh, Lord God. Have mercy and heal our sister in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, my sister, dear. Father God, I lay my hands on our sister in Jesus' name for her healing. Now the church go to praying for these sick people out here. Now start praying. Father God, I lay hands as I weaken down. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our sister. Amen. Come, my brother. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, give to him the desire of his heart. Amen. Almighty God, as our sister comes, grant to her her healing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Would you come, sister? Get over the nervousness. Now, just go on. You're healed anyhow. So you, you, all right, come. And when I said nervousness to her, it happened to you too, so you can go on your nervousness as soon as so. Believe now with all your heart. Come now. Have faith out there. Believe in God. Be reverent and pray. Lord God, I lay hands upon the woman because it's commissioned by my Lord who's present now to make known his gospel. May our sister be healed. Amen. Amen. Come, sister dear. You have a disease that a lot of these people out here are suffering with. You want to see how many suffering out there? Nervous heart. How many out there suffer with a nervous trouble? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Look there. How could you ever call them all? But do you believe now? All right. In the name of the Lord Jesus, let my sister be well. Amen. God bless you. Is that right? We'll certainly do that, sister. This is already addressed to her. All right, they got some of them right here. We're going to take them right in a few minutes and pray for them. God bless you, sister. God bless you. Come, sister dear. Now, Lord, who raised Jesus from the dead, I pray that you'll give to our sister the desire of her heart as she's reverently stood in the line waiting. I pray this prayer of faith in Christ's name. Amen. Bless you, sister. Don't doubt now. Believe with all your heart. And gracious God, I put my hands upon this woman who thou hast fed and raised all her life, given her the breath that she breathes. You hold it in your hand. May I lay my hands upon her in the name of your son, Jesus, and may she be healed. Amen. Amen. That's right, sister. God bless you. Come, my sister, dear. You might think you're a little old, but you're not. God never called Abraham until he was 75. 
then give him the promise when he was a hundred or fulfill the promise. Amen. So you can be healed now. Lord God, give unto this sister her desire. Amen. Bless you, sister. Come, sister dear. Just look at the people's praying for you. You have to get well. Lord, I pray that you'll heal her. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Come reverently, sister, believing. Nothing is impossible with God. Father, as she holds the word of life in her hand, may it become real to her for her desire. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Now, little lady, we see your crooked limb. That's probably polio, and you know that God can heal that. Oh, how many I have seen him heal. I have prayed for a little lady here some time ago. was so crippled, she had two crutches on or two braces on. And she was laying in bed that night when they removed the crutches. And the next morning, her mother fainted. Here she come walking across the floor, normally in the hole. God had come to the bed through the night and had made her whole. Oh, Lord, I lay hands upon this young girl. Lord, she'll always be twisted if you don't help her. Let it be for her, Lord, will you? I pray the sincerity of my heart with a fervent, affectional prayer to thee. Let it be with this girl also that she'll be made well. Through Jesus Christ's name, amen. Bless you, sister, and give you what you ask for. You believe it, don't you? Then he'll never fail you. Come, sister. Amen. Almighty God, I lay hands upon our sister in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. Amen. Believe that. You believe, sister dear? Lord, as I lay hands upon the woman, as she comes not to a man but to God, we pray, Father, that you'll heal her in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God, bless this little lady, and may she be healed, and may the request in her heart for another loved one be granted to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I see he knows all things. That's right. All right. You believe now, sister? Father God, as I lay hands upon our sister and ask reverently in Jesus' name that you'll heal her. Amen. God bless you, sister. Come now. You want to get over your arthritis and be made well? Just believe him that you'll receive it. Lord, in Jesus' name, heal her of arthritis and give her the desire of her heart. Amen. Come, my sister. Father God, as I reach out to take hold of this woman's hand. I pray that you'll heal her, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, sister. Father God, I catch the hand of this woman, and by the feel of her hand, she's worked hard. Oh, Lord God, may her reward come. May she be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Come. A blind man, a brother, God gives sight to the blind. You believe that, don't you, sir? If there was any way that I could open your eyes, I'd be glad to do it. I can't open your eyes. I'm just a man. But I can pray for God to do it who can do it. And you believe and he'll grant it to you. The audience, pray with me for the blind man. Dear God, this man sitting in darkness. But you came by a city gate one day and a blind man cried for mercy. And you just spoke to him and said, Receive thy sight. And you turned and went on down the road. You had not gone very far until the man began to notice that he could receive his sight. And he began to rejoicing and started following you, praising God. O Lord God, who sent Jesus to die in our stead, that our unrighteousness might be not imputed unto us, but that his righteousness might atone for us. Let it be tonight, as I, your unprofitable servant, lay hands upon the blind man, may he receive his sight in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God grant it to you, my brother. Go believe him, and it will happen if you believe it. Father God, in the name of Jesus, grant the healing of this woman for your glory. Amen. If thou canst believe all things, are you believing with me? Is ever doubt vanished from your hearts? All unbelief is gone. There's a colored lady sitting back there with a red hat on, praying for her stomach condition. 
You can receive your healing. That's right. That didn't. I do not know the lady. I've never seen her. You say, how did that happen, Brother Branham? I don't know. The woman was sitting there praying. Asked her. And something she touched. And when it did, I seen the light go over and break. And there was a vision. The woman with the stomach trouble, back and away. Rich foods makes her sick and nauseous and acids on her teeth and things. It's a peptic ulcer. But she's going to be well now. She, well, look at her. She's, 20, she's 15 yards from me. We don't know each other. What happened? I've never seen her. She couldn't touch me, could she? But she touched something that's present. What was it? To fulfill the Bible, the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities? The woman sitting there. She has no prayer card. She'd been in the line. So she just began to believe. And what happened? Something happened. The same thing happened that when someone touched Jesus, a woman with a blood issue, he turned and said, Someone touched me. And he looked around until he found her and said, Thy blood issue is gone. Your faith has made you well. Now the same Jesus, not me, she touched him. I'm a man. I don't know her. I just intellectually. But the Holy Spirit is here. The one I spoke of, the bomb that's given to the church. She touched the high priest and he turned and showed what it was. Now, is not that Jesus the same yesterday and forever? Not Brother Branham the same yesterday and forever, but Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's who it is. It's our blessed Heavenly Father who we love with all our heart. Do you love Him? Now, is that all? Oh, I'm sorry, sister. You're uh, one of the patients. All right. We are strange too, aren't we? Now here, just a moment, for the rest of you. This is the last one in the prayer line here, but not the last one to be healed. If we are strangers to each other, it again comes to a white and color. I, I don't know you. You don't know me. If that's right, so the people will see. We've never met. This is our first time. But if Jesus will reveal to me the secret of your heart, will you believe that it's Him doing it? Will the audience accept Him right here that He knows the secret of your heart and will give to you? See, people in the prayer line with their cards, people in the audience without cards, it doesn't matter. But it's, it just makes me so weak. The lady's trouble is on her limbs. It's, it's something that just itches and burns. And you've been to the doctors, and the doctors can do nothing about it. You believe God can tell me who you are? Mrs. Howe, go home. It'll leave you. Jesus Christ will make you well. Is there a person in here believing with all your heart? Now you, how many believers are here? Now raise up your hand and say, I believe. Now I'm going to tell you what the Bible said. The Bible said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Now all of you that's sick, raise up your hands. Now let each one lay your hands on one another. If you're believers, lay your hands on each other. See, it's not just for myself. It's for his daughter, the church. Why is my daughter not recovered? If there is bomb in Gilead, if there is a physician, then why isn't my daughter recovered? See, now it's all here. Do you believe the physician is here? You believe the bomb is here, the Holy Spirit? Then just receive it. Now lay your hands on each other. Now don't you pray for yourself. You pray for the person that you got your hands on. They'll pray for you. And that way, God will heal every one of you. Are you ready to pray? Lay your hands on each other now. Let's bow our heads. Lord, there is a possibility 
that there's men and women sitting here that we'll never meet again this side of the river. But when I come to that last day, and we have to stand in that presence as we are standing now, with all my heart I've told the people thy truth, quoting it from your word, that the last words that you said before you left the earth, According to the Scriptures, you said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. And the last words that come from your lips said, If they lay hands on the sick, Amen. they shall recover. Amen. Now, in this school auditorium tonight, there's many hands of believers laying on the sick, and they are praying. And hear us, O oh God, and pray that you'll answer prayer, every prayer that's being made at this time. May the power of sickness be broke tonight in the life and bodies of each of these people. May the Holy Spirit speak in a special way just now, as He has did, and letting the people know that Christ, the Son of the living God, is not dead, but is alive forevermore and is here with us. May His presence and power pass through this audience on to every lip and into every person. May the blessed Holy Spirit's power sweep and break the shackles of sickness and all them be set free. Hear the prayer of your servant, Lord, as I command all sickness to leave the bodies of these people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All that accept Jesus as your personal healer and believes that God has healed your body, stand to your feet as a witness unto this great healing power of the Lord God. I don't care if you're crippled, whatever's wrong, stand up on your feet and accept your healing. All right, Joseph. If you believe it with all your heart, raise your hand. In the commission of the Holy Spirit, by the word of the living God, I pronounce every one of you healed according to your faith in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Go and rejoice.